real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real grit. Let's get to it. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the channel. Hey, everybody, welcome to Real Grit. I got Rocky Lobani here with me, serves as a profitability advisor for business owners. He teaches them how to ensure they get paid and make profit, how to make that a priority. As a certified profit first professional, he implements Mike's profit first system. This ensures profit actually comes first. It's not all about money and costs. People come before money. So I'm excited to have him here. Rocky, how are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the show, hey, Neil. Thanks for being on here. You know, Mike's book, Profit First, has served as a, as a catalyst for a lot of people to actually give thought to how do they implement and structure, you know, a profit-based system. But for lots of folks, in certainly in the financial aspect, because they're so busy doing and earning that some of these things just get pushed to the wayside. And, and it sounds like you serve as an advisor to make sure it actually gets brought to the forefront to ensure profit indeed comes first. And that's absolutely true. I mean, if we're going to work this hard, we deserve to be profitable. We deserve to get paid and we should have rewards for the hard work we put in. And too often, even with real estate investors, I am shocked at how often I see a ton of top line revenue and I see nothing in their pockets. And that is not cool. We need to make sure there's something in your pocket. My favorite saying here at my office is profit is not a four letter word. So we say profit is a habit, not an event, right? Oh, that's it totally is, true. Yes. Something that happens all the time. Every single deal needs to be profitable. Every month, your rental needs to be profitable. Every month, you as a business owner need to be profitable. Yep. Talk to me. Where do you see um, real estate entrepreneurs, uh, those who run real estate businesses? You know, where do, where do folks get it wrong? What should they be doing? You know, maybe what a couple habits aspects they should be implementing to totally get it right. So when I look at real estate investors, I look at them by the type of real estate they do. Sure. And there's a million different flavors of real estate. Everyone does things differently. So let's just break it down to a couple different types. Um, I have rental properties, right? So yeah. when I look at my rental properties every month, I've got a mortgage, I've got uh, principal payment, I've got taxes, mm -hmm. I've got insurance payments. And after that, I have money left over, right? Yep. People think that's profit. It's not, right? Because after the money's left over, I still have long-term capital repairs. I have vacancy. Yep. I have general maintenance and all of that. When we go to buy the property, most Guys, girls, whoever's doing it will sit down and they'll create a pro forma on the yep. property. They'll put percentages to all of that stuff and say, this is what it is. And then they'll go buy the property. And then as soon as the money comes in, they take it. Right. Yep. They don't actually follow the pro forma. And a big part of profit first is to say, hey, if you're going to have a 5% vacancy allocation, then you're going to take 5% of your rent. You're mm -hmm. going to put it in a bank account called vacancy. And every month, 5% goes in there. You go, why are you doing this? Why, why do I want to build up this cash? Yep. Because when you have a vacancy, right? And you yep. still need to make the mortgage payment. You have a pile of money sitting there to make the mortgage payment. Yep. And it's no big deal. It, you don't lose sleep over it. Cool. When the roof needs replaced in an emergency, which is absolute BS, because you bought the property with a 25-year-old roof, you knew it needed to be replaced in three Correct. years. Correct. You didn't allocate and save the money aside. Right. Then when the roof repair comes, you start juggling things, you start playing games. But if we set aside for these long-term repairs that we know are coming, 
when the time comes to repair it, you just go, oh, there's money in the account. I can just allocate it to a new roof, a new heating system, whatever it is. And it takes all the emotion out of it. You do not need to do this per property. You can group all your properties mm-hmm. and have one large vacancy account, one large capital improvement account, one large you know account for just general maintenance or whatever it is. If you're not escrowing real estate taxes, have an account to put your real estate taxes aside a little bit every month. So when, you know, especially if you're in the same area, you got 20 properties and all the tax bills come together. Whoa, that's a wake up call, right? Correct. Yep. Yep. So have that all set aside so that when the time comes, it's there. What I notice with most real estate investors is every time they see a dollar, they need to invest it. And that's wonderful. But then they go, how come I don't have any cash? It's because it's all tied up in your property. Right. And if you don't have cash flow, guess what? I come to buy your properties at a discount when they go to foreclosure. That's, that's how you get wiped out. There's so many people, certainly in today's environment, it's asset rich, cash poor. They don't budget for it. But you know, I know you've given us a, a simple explanation and a simple methodology about how it applies, but it doesn't really matter if you got one property and one roof, or you got you got 10 or a hundred, or you you run multiple commercial properties. It's a similar, it's the same strategy. Same thing applies. It is the same strategy. And if you're a syndicator, the reality is you're following the strategy. You're building reserve funds. When you buy the building, you yeah. automatically start with a capital improvement fund or the you do this automatically because you're required to. But the rest of us, you know, we try and wing it and then we get ourselves in trouble. Same thing for a flipper. Like I flipped houses and yeah. we always, the first thing we did was add our profit to the deal. It was a fixed amount. If we didn't make at least this much profit, we didn't make the deal happen. The problem I see with most flippers is they always under budget. And so what I always tell them is we add 10% to like every single line item. We add 10% to um, what our rehab costs are. Then even within that, we add 10% for the things we forgot to add. And then we take the selling price and we minus 10% because I got to pay commission you may yep. have to pay transfer taxes. Tax pro. Yep. You might also have to pay. Um, usually there's always a couple grand at, at the, the back in the day when we actually had houses inspected, yes. <laughs> things popped up. And yep. so that covered that or if if they needed money towards a down payment. So by building in all these extra layers of fudge factor, instead of Most of people fudge to the low, like they, oh, I can make this happen. They get emotionally involved. Yep. We try to build it all in so that we know that we can screw up and still be profitable. And I think that's a big part of it for them. If you're a wholesaler, the biggest thing I see with wholesalers is they are throwing a ton of money out in advertising. Are you getting a return? Which channel works? Mm. Which campaigns and which channels work? Are they continuing to work? What does your advertising budget look like as a percentage of how much you're getting in sales? And are you tracking that every single month saying, hey, is my system working? Because it doesn't take long for one employee gets switched and all of a sudden your close ratio goes out the door. Correct. And then you're burning cash like there's no tomorrow. So it's keeping, again, each type of real estate has its own metrics. You've got to have a system in place. It's got to be automated. It's got to have a dashboard. And you have to look at it every single month to say, hey, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do I need to make a change? Move past the line items or in the avenues for you know how to budget and how to um, where to allocate dollars and cents inside the business. Talk to me about tax. So you made some money. Um, how are you accounting for tax, budgeting for tax? And how are you seeing this play out when it comes to real estate investors? And maybe it shows up in Well, certainly shows up in their decision-making process at times. So I think it depends. Each of those things Mm -hmm. that we talked about have different tax ramifications. With rentals, taxes don't seem to be a big deal because of depreciation. So no brainer there. It works out. For flippers and wholesalers, if you're not putting taxes aside, as you do each property, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You also need to have a conversation about how you're being treated 
as a whether you're being treated as a real estate professional, professional. whether no. you're not. So you need to have those types of conversations. More often than not, you know, when it comes to the 1031, I see people chasing the tax, letting taxes wag the dog mm. instead of making the best decisions. And so they'll say, I'm going to 1031 it, which puts you under a gun. And they'll make a bad choice on the next property just to save on taxes. Honestly, I, we just did a property. I paid the taxes. I just stroked a quarterly check to the government. It did not feel good. But we set the side of money, the money aside from the sale. And now I have freedom. I have freedom to go look for a deal on my timelines when I can make a ton of extra money because I'm not chasing something. You know, I got 10 days to make this offer. So I, I got to buy something. Yeah. To make a decision to identify a hand, just a few properties. And then you may end up in a deal that, you know, really looks super poor a couple yeah. quarters from now or a few years from now. Well, you'll pull the trigger because you're like, oh, I'll make it up in taxes. So now you're doing work for essentially no money. And that's the other thing I think we forget is time, right? Sure. Time is a factor. If you're not factoring your time in and you're not valuing it at an extremely high level, then that's a bigger part of the problem. You'll see a lot of early flippers, I think, or yep. early wholesalers. Yep are not accounting for how much time they're putting into a deal and they're not putting a dollar cost on it. So I was profitable. Well, yeah, you were profitable, but if I figure out the time and the hours, you're making minimum wage. Like Correct. what's that all about? <laughs> Correct. ROT is what I call it, right? You got to have a return on time and, the, and whatever the project looks like. I can tell you, we still flip today. We flip to generate dollars and cents. So they get deployed in the commercial side on a long-term basis. But when we go in and flip, whether a property takes us two weeks or five weeks, I got a different line item for profit. The longer we have to be there, the more we have to make. And for, for everybody out there, you know, our average flip time is just under shade under three weeks, start to finish for the contract so that it goes back on the market. So they're, you know, the types of projects we're doing is it in a tight band, right? In order to make that work. So if you're doing that kind of flip, I'm thinking it's mostly paint and carpet and yeah, we call them, call them fixtures forward, right? No, okay. we're not not open up walls, not moving walls, right? You're doing cabinets at most and some bathrooms at times and so siding roof. Yeah, very basic. Yeah. yeah. And that's fine. And the way we looked at it is the more capital that I need to put into the renovation. Yes. And the more time it's going to take, the bigger my profit margin is, because at the Correct. end of the day, you're taking a risk. Yep. And it's not hard to make a slight mistake or Correct. open up a wall and go, oh, there were termites here. Right. <laughs> or look at that knob and tube. Interesting. Right. And that crushes your budget. So budget for it. Leave yourself margin. That's the biggest thing. I think people don't. They get so excited and emotional. They yeah. don't leave margin. The longer you're there, the more stuff you're going to find. The longer that budget's going to run, the easier it is for that budget to run long. Correct. And don't forget, you've got to pay all those people up front. Contractors like money up front. So that's cash out of your pocket, which comes back to, hey, if I buy this property and I put down the money to buy it, maybe you're doing hard money or whatever it is. What is that costing me? And when am I actually going to get a dollar back in my pocket? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times, especially in the beginning, we don't think about this and, and investors get stuck because all the money is tied up in the project. And if you run a little short and yep. you don't have extra reserves, <laughs> your project goes boom. Yeah. You know what I've seen? Go, I'm going back to taxes. What I have seen a lot, I cut my teeth in the real estate brokerage side. And so what I saw a lot of is, you know, people sell, 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 earn their money, not pay taxes and earn for the first quarter of the next year, socking cash away in order to pay taxes come April. Right. And I think what we may well experience is, you know, as we record this, interest rates have almost doubled over the course of the last, you know, 12 months. Um, in my market, prices are starting to pull back. Price reductions, the number of uh, price reductions each week on the market continues to increase. Um, it's just getting a little softer out there. I could anticipate where you could see what I just described. Somebody goes into Q1 to save money and all of a sudden sales, flips, your investments, the cash just isn't there. 
And all of a sudden you're going to stare down a tax day and you got a problem if you didn't allocate it appropriately. And that is very true. What we do is on every deal or every month, depending on your tax situation and what expectations are, we put money aside in a tax account. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll be honest, if it's early in the year um, and we're saving for next year's taxes, some of my guys, gals will borrow from their tax fund instead of borrowing from a hard money lender Mm -hmm. or and they'll do that. But they know, hey, I need to get this money back in the tax fund for later on. And, and they'll do that, but it's done intentionally. Yeah. It is not done without thinking it through because yeah. the IRS is brutal when it comes to uh, no doubt. coming for your money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, guilty until proven innocent, right? Mm-hmm. The law rolls that way. Tell me, um, so you work with real estate investors. How do you work with folks? What does working with you even look like? So- for most people, we work one-on-one. And what we do is we create custom dashboards for their business. Mm. So what's your business model? How do we figure out the profitability in the way that you do real estate? Because everyone does it differently. Right. Everyone's got a different angle. So let's figure out your angle and then let's start measuring, right? A lot of guys do this in their head. Oh, we're going to flip this house. These are my numbers. Okay. Okay. Let's actually measure what did you say was going to happen, and let's measure it against what actually happened. Let's also talk about if you're going to deploy capital, when are we going to get it back? What does that look like for the rest of your cash flow? Let's project out your cash flow, depending on the investors. You know, We might project out 13 weeks. We might project out a year, depending on the size of the project. If you're doing you know, big land projects, your money's tied up for years, years. years. So we've got to project all of that out to say, what does that look like? And then what are our dashboards look like? And we'll tie them into whatever dashboards you're using. Mm. So a lot of you may have sales dashboards Mm -hmm. or those types of things. We take those numbers and then we add them and we put the money behind them to see what is the outcome look like. And then we are constantly evaluating. Is it a good or is it bad? What do we need to change? And then we look at the leaks in the business. Every business overspends. Where are the leaks in your business? How do we tighten them up? Where can we pull extra? And then we start thinking about the business. So if you look at someone who does real estate and you start examining all their deals, you'll start to see a picture. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've noticed when we do this over here, we can make a killing. Let's go over here. Yeah. Like I know when we were flipping back in the day and they stole all the copper out of the house, yep. we would applaud it because I knew I could replace copper for probably about 20 cents of the discount that I would get because the copper was gone. So if we could find a house that pipes were gone, we were thrilled because we knew that it was it picked up so much more money in our pocket compared to what everyone else was willing to pay. But you've got to know that. So then you start telling people, hey, this is what we're looking for. Like we would pick up two bedroom houses in our area. They didn't like two bedroom houses. But if we can pick up a two bedroom and convert it to a three, throw in an extra half bath, do something like that, we're adding tremendous value. So it's teaching what are we looking for so that we can find value where others don't see it. I would imagine based on simply on the basis of if you measure it and you pay attention to it, it tends to improve. So I can imagine you've got experienced a whole bunch of stories and significant shifts in profit from people who just because you put anything in place and paid attention to it, and now you can start to think about it. And all of a sudden, what you pay attention to matters and it starts to increase. It does. And I think the biggest issue we come up with real estate is a lot of people are doing millions of dollars in top line. Yeah. And because of that, they're not paying attention to the little stuff. Oh, it's a hundred dollars. Oh, it's a hundred. Well, it's a hundred dollars times 50 times, 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 right. And then, and that's just the 100 times 50. Correct. And we're doing, you know, 20 100s times 50. And all of a sudden we're starting to get into big money. And I think that's one of the biggest things with real estate investors because the top line looks so big, correct? 
they get confused. And, and Mike talks about that in the book. He talks about what's real revenue. And real revenue is we take out all of that and we look at what's the actual money left over for you because every extra dollar you put into something is a dollar out of your pocket. And yep. being focused on the little stuff and improving the systems and processes on the little stuff because it will multiply massively over time. My experience as well is that people do not properly account for, mentally account for overhead. No. They the don't. Dumpster. The dump, I mean, just that. How about the lights at the office? All the things that add up to going into doing anything. Phone systems that cost thousands of dollars a year in which to operate. All these things that you just almost, I want to say take for granted, but it's not part of the deal. And therefore, it's not the first thing in, that you're thinking about, but they add up in big ways. Well, and also joining uh, groups, paying for education, sure. all that stuff. It gets very expensive very quick. And if you're not implementing what you learned, mm -hmm. it's money down the drain. Too often we're told you, you got to spend money to make money. I'm try and tell people you don't have to spend money to make money. There are ways to do this without spending money. You got to get more resourceful yep. instead of using more resources. resources. I love it. What and, a great and that's quote. the key, yep. right? If you can learn to do that, you can figure out how to make money on other people's money without having to pay hard money rates. Yeah. Let's do this. I want to move into the final segment, what I call yeah. for, for impact. Your favorite quote, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. What about that resonates most with you? Except the sharpening, right? Nobody hears that part of the quote. Everyone wants to go sharpen everybody else. Mm. Nobody wants to accept the sharpening. And let's face mm. it, you take a blade and you go against the stone. What does it do? Lots of sparks, lots of heat. Correct. And, and if you're getting sharpened, you're going to feel lots of sparks and lots of heat. Yep. You've got to accept that if you want to be the best you can be. Lean into it. It's part of the process. It is. Yeah. What do you think holds most investors back from hitting their personal next level? So I think a lot of times it's fear, the self-doubt, that voice mm. in our head that we yeah. all have that nobody talks about. Yeah. Right. It's that constant doubt. And so there's two parts to this. One, one half of us have the doubt. And the other half have somehow turned it off entirely and take risks that are unbelievably crazy. Yeah. So you've got to find a balance. So it's funny, when we were doing a lot of the flips, my partner and I are at opposite ends of the spectrum. And it was perfect yeah. because when we could find agreement, we always made money. We yeah. never did stupid because of that. I was just going to say that it's, it's so much of that on both ends of the extreme, right? That you just described. Uh, it's tough to turn off the self-doubt. It's tough to turn off the risk-taking. It's the partner who can bring you back or bring you to some sort of happy median. It's so it good. is. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? Being a dad. Yeah. I had, you know, I had the time and the flexibility to be part of all my kids' activities do Boy Scouts, coach their soccer, coach their robotics, the freedom to go be there while they grew up. And now they're they're kind of launched and one is just about to finish college. And I got to be there for all of that. Now we're getting ready for round two, which is, okay, now that you guys are settled, let's start buying real estate, you know, with your new, with you guys and get yeah. you started at an early age yeah. because real estate's a time game. Correct. And, if you can get in at an early age and start building it right, you're done early. Correct. And so that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? So two things. We do a ton of charity work. I, I'm, I'm on local boards and we volunteer our time. That's a big part of it. Local community. The other thing I love doing is just teaching. And yeah. the way I teach is I have two podcasts and we teach everything that we do for our clients. We teach yeah. how to be smarter, better, and how to improve ourselves and all the lessons that I learned in life that I wish I would have listened to at a younger age. And known earlier, right? Yeah. And known earlier. Yeah. yeah but exactly. the funny thing is, and, and I realized that even had you come and told me that mm -hmm. at 22, yeah. I would have told you you were a fool instead of understanding I was. Yeah. 
sometimes uh, some of those things we got to learn ourselves and whatever, whatever, however it presents it. Right. We do. Uh, what, what's the old saying? Um, when the student is ready, the teacher shall appear. That is correct. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Rocky, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to connect up here. You've got a um, wonderful mission really to continue to, to put profit first and make sure that it is a habit. It's a requirement without it. No, none of us are in business anymore. It's a requirement. It has to be there for people who want to connect with you. They want to find you. They want to follow you. They want to learn about the podcasts that you do. What, what should they do? Where should they go? Uh, the website is profitcomesfirst.com. And from there you can, the profit answer man podcast is where I teach everything about profit. So everything I do for my clients, I teach on the show and we do that. And if you want to learn how to live a richer, more meaningful life, then that's on Richer Soul. You can find it all off that website. The links are all there. Perfect. We'll make sure we get the links put uh, below in the show notes for everybody. Rocky, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me here today. You bet. For everybody here at Real Grit, I'm Neil Timmons reminding you that real estate requires real grit. See you next time. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the challenge. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone, or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free Partner in Profit Guide, which includes the top five must-answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.